Greetings, friends. This is Brian Russell. Welcome back to class. I want to answer a few of the questions from our forums from Module 2, which, get, which will cover survey methodology for inductive Bible study and specific questions from the genealogy of Matthew's Gospel 1, 1 through 17. I answered most of the questions directly in the discussion forum, the shorter ones. And if I didn't answer your specific questions because I addressed it elsewhere, so go ahead and read through the entire forum. But here are some answers to questions on survey and the genealogy itself. Regarding survey methodology, does my decision of where to divide the units affect my ability to find significant structures? Maybe. Again, the key thing is you want to ask how do you your units relate to each other. So perhaps if you have way too many main units, you may not be able to find structures, but a sense, in a sense there's a balance. Sometimes structure will show you the main units. Sometimes the main units lead to structure. So if you're really having a difficult time finding structure, that might be an indication that you need to rethink how you've divided up the units. Are you dividing them based on details in the text? or have you imposed some structure that really isn't in the text itself? So you just want to give and take. And sometimes it's just difficult to find structures. Now, once you do have your main units, the easiest way to find structures is to ask yourself this question. So let's take your unit one. How does unit one relate to unit two? What would be the relationship in those structural relationships give you tools to talk about how one unit relates to another one. How does unit one relate to unit three? Maybe it does, but at least the ones that are in proximity to each other. And then you can work backwards. How does unit three, if yours three units, relate back to unit two? Or how does unit two relate back to unit one? That will help you, and I think that can move you past that particular issue. In a sense, I just answered the second question. When we say that it's a major structure, if it links two major units, is that literally? Now, this person also wanted to know, does that mean you just need to focus on the last verse of a main unit and the first verse of the next main unit? And the answer to that is no. Again, the key thing is you want to ask, okay, what's taking place in unit one? How does it relate to what comes next in the entire main unit? And when, so you want to look at it bigger. It's not just a matter of what one verse does. Again, when we were talking about the genealogy, there were some very small main units, so it might be a verse. But we're going to be working with some larger main units where you may have 10 or 15 verses. So you're not just ever looking at one verse. You're looking at how the whole relates to the next, though there could be some significant verses in there. So yeah, when we say it's a major structure, if it links at least two main units, that's, that is literally... Now, the 50% rule comes in if you have a main unit that in and of itself encompasses 50% of the material. And then if there would be a structure that's just inside one of the main units, that could be a major structure by virtue of the 50% rule. So, for example, to illustrate from the genealogy, the recurrence of women or mothers in Jesus' genealogy functions within 1, 1 to 7, uh, 1, 1 to, or 1, 2 to 16, which, depending on how you broke the, the, the book up, could be one big main unit. And can you have one verse main units? And the answer is yes. Now, this threw some of you off. And, what, and if you only have a one verse main unit, you probably aren't going to have subunits. And that's the whole thing with IBS. We have a system, we have rules of thumbs, we have the basics, but you have to allow it to take into account specific contexts. Now, most of the time, you're not going to just have a one verse main unit, but for shorter passages, such as the genealogy, you can have a one verse main unit. And in fact, just based on how the structures work in the genealogy, it's pretty clear that one one functions as the heading in 117, it's even marked, 117 is marked off with thus or therefore, and it's clear that that's sort of a summarizing, a climax. So those are clear that 1 and 17 can stand apart from the genealogy proper. That would be 1, 2 to 16. So it always depends. As long as you can justify the positions that you take by means of evidence, the answer to your question would be yes. Now let me also say one other thing now that I'm that I as it comes to mind after you've done your main units 
in subbing instead of your outline, you should give a couple of sentences that justify why you broke up the main units where you did. Just forcing yourself to write that out will be helpful for you. Okay, let's move now to questions about the genealogy itself. And several of you are interested in why I didn't call verse 1 preparation realization. Well, the reality is you can. And so that, that would be appropriate, and that would even be an appropriate um, amendment to my genealogy. Um, I call it particularization, and it's not a generalization. Because remember, generalization goes from the particulars to the general. This is an example of particularization because it moves from a general statement. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's a general statement that then is fleshed out in the rest of the genealogy. In fact, note, look at my notes, it's also a chiasm. Verse 1 has Christ, son of David, Abraham, and then the genealogy unfolds Abraham, David, the Christ, right? But it is also introductory, so that's not a, um, a problem. I would just say, argue that it's more properly particularization, but if you have introduction, we're, we are talking about the same thing, which again, critical, make sure you explain what you see. It's more important to see the movements through the text than it is to get the right label. Does that, so that's a critical piece. Describe what you see, because you could have the wrong labels and see the movements, and that you're going to be moving towards a, a good interpretation, regardless if you have the IBS lingo correctly. So make sure you're always describing what you see. Okay, recurrence of mothers versus fathers. And some of you had contrast, and that's right. I mean, it's a contrast in the sense that you have all of these mentions of fathers and you have some mothers, so that's completely appropriate to call that contrast because it isolates and highlights the function of the mothers. Now, you will note in my survey, I don't really say anything about recurrence of fathers. That's because that's, that's what the whole genealogy is, so it's kind of like saying recurrence of the. Of course, the happens over, but it's not really significant. What jumps out of the genealogy are, is the recurrence of, the, of mothers that stand out from the, um, from the pattern that's ex established, right? Now, you could say in the genealogy there's a recurrence of a pattern, and that's what the mothers breaks, but that's why I highlight mothers, because it's something that breaks the typical pattern that we see. And then some of you wanted to know about the significance of Abraham and David. This is in the notes, but we also should throw in here Christ, because Christ isn't Jesus' last name. I know you all know that, but sometimes we treat it like it. Remember, Christ is Messiah. So essentially, the genealogy doesn't lack action or data. In fact, it's profound for Christology, because up front, Matthew wants the reader, us, to know that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. Now, that all raises expectations. Uh, Christ is Jesus' identity as the person through whom God is going to proclaim and inaugurate the kingdom. It's in Jesus, the kingdom of heaven comes near to us. God comes near to us. Uh, son of David is another title, and if you study Son of David, you can look at my notes for this. In Matthew's Gospel, um, David is seen as the one who brings salvation, and Matthew is going to expand salvation to include things like healing. So the blind uh, beggars will call out to David, or, or call out to Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Abraham connects Jesus's who is Israel's Messiah, he, and we'll see in the next assignment, his name will be Jesus, he will save his people from their sins. An open question in Matthew's gospel is this, who are God's people, right? Is it just Israel, or is it the nations? By being the son of Abraham, that reminds that's a way of Matthew reminding his readers that Abraham was the source, or going to be the agent through whom all the nations were going to be blessed. Go back and take a look at, like, for example, Genesis 12, 3. This is demonstrable within Matthew's gospel. If you go look at Matthew uh, chapter 8 and look at the healing of the centurion where Jesus mentions Abraham's na name, 
in the context of the healing of a Gentile. So that's the significance. So Abraham reminds us of the missiological significance of Jesus's mission. Son of David is an, uh, is, raises the expectation of Jesus as bringing salvation, and Christ is the long-awaited figure who's going to inaugurate, announce God's kingdom. So this is uh, this genealogy is explosive with potential. Which brings us up to the one non-person in the genealogy, which several of you noticed. This is, uh, and some of you wanted to call this a climax because it seems out of place. It's the, it's the exile. And the exile is profound because the exile was a complete disaster in the Old Testament, which, with, which raises the question, is there a future for God's people? You may have even noticed in the genealogy itself, you are much more familiar with names on the past side of the exile than on the Jesus side of the exile. And so one of the questions ends up being, what, how do you fit exile into understanding God's plan? And how is it that the Jesus can be the Christ? And that's where this number 14 comes in. There's 14 from Abraham to David. There's 14 from David to the exile. And there's 14 generations from the exile to Jesus. So what that suggests then is that God has been in control of history and that it's unfolded under God's providence. So in fact, even the exile and all its horror was not the final word and it fits right into the flow. And so Jesus is appearing at precisely the time that he should appear. Again, there's lots of good stuff here, folks. So just give you a taste and you always want to dig deeper. I'll tell you a funny story. First time I went and talked to Dr. David Bauer in his office, we were, I was trying to be funny, and I told him, and we were actually doing this assignment. We were working on the genealogy of Matthew's gospel, and I had joked with him and said, you know, I always skip the genealogy because, I mean, there's nothing in it. And Bauer immediately looked at me and said, well, Brian, I have a 50-page paper on the Christology of Matthew's gospel that I've published in an academic journal. You should never skip any part of the Bible. Well, I can tell you right there that I thought, whoops, so much for my first impression. And so I've, I, that reminded me, wow, if Bauer could find 50 pa things to write 50 pages just about the Christology and the genealogy, I better never assume that any part of Scripture doesn't have something profound in it. Anyway, I hope you enjoy that story. I've been in your shoes before. I'm rooting for you. Help, let me know if I can help you with anything. Again, I'm Brian Russell. It's my privilege to be your professor this semester.